Welcome to my Not Quite Safe for Work CISSP study guide. This is going to be domain one, access control. Now I want to talk a little bit about my style for these presentations. I don't personally have a CISSP yet, I'm studying for one. And these are going to sort of act like my study notes. I'm going to read a bunch of different things, online, in books, and so forth, and then try to put them in a format that's digestible to people. Now while I don't have my CISSP yet myself, I'm hoping the teachers I learn, and I have this pet theory that it takes a noob to teach a noob. But even if you're not a noob, there's certain ways that the ISC squared apparently does questions and the way they think that's a little bit odd to some people, even if you've been in security or IT for a long time. For instance, let's say the uh, protocol data unit at the different layers. Now, if you ask me what it is on the network layer, okay, packets, that makes sense. On the data link layer, frames, that makes sense. But Apparently, they want you to respond bits on the physical layer. The thing is, I can't see that as the discrete ons and offs because the way it's encoded it could be a waveform. It could be multiple levels of voltage to encode more than just one bit at a time. So that seems like an odd thing to think of it as. I don't normally think of the physical layer as having a protocol unit of bits. But you know, that's the kind of thing that you might come up on an ISC squared test. One of the things you should also be aware of is that my presentations are not necessarily going to be safe for work. For instance, um, I want to use mnemonics from time to time that I think will help people remember things better than the standard mnemonics. And since um, I grew up in electronics when violet was still an acceptable um, mnemonic to use, well, I've come up with other mnemonics like anal porn shows the naughty dirt pipe as a way of remembering the OSI layers. Now, granted, that might offend some people, but I think it's a really good way of memorizing these. So if that offends you, this is probably not the CISSP study guide for you. Now we go on to what exactly is access control. The title pretty much covers it, I and mean, it's controlling access. Who has access to what? How it's controlled. D. This domain covers technologies and practices to control levels and types of access a subject has to an object, and more than just logical things like file permissions, but also physical access. Many think of security as CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is essentially keeping things secret, keeping people who don't need to know something from knowing it. Integrating is making sure that things don't get changed in a way that are not so get, supposed to get changed. For instance, if I can go in and change my grade, well, that system has a lack of integrity if I can do that online. Also, there's availability. Think of your denial of service attack. If someone does a denial of service attack against something, well, its availability has gone down. Or if someone steals your laptop, well, first of all, confidentiality is out the window because they might be able to read things off the hard drive, assuming you don't have a full hard drive encryption. Uh, integrity is kind of out there too since they could modify things in your hard drive and give it back to you and availability is definitely out if they don't give it back because then you don't have the resource to use. So that's CIA in a nutshell. The CIA of CYA, so to speak. Also, sometimes it's um, put in a different order. CIA also means Central Intelligence Agency, at least a lot of people in the U.S. So sometimes they use a different TLA for it. By the way, TLA is short for free letter now, I've heard elsewhere, ISC squared focuses more on DAD than CIA, but essentially DAD is just the inverse of CIA. DAD stands for Disclosure, Alteration, and Destruction. So apparently the people who came up with this knew my DAD. Destruction is the exact opposite of availability. Alteration is the exact opposite of integrity. And Disclosure is the exact opposite of confidentiality. So you're pretty much looking at the exact same thing, just from the opposite side of it. Confidentiality protects against disclosure, and availability protects against destruction. Integrity prevents against alteration. It's just a different way of looking at things. Now, a few CIA examples. Uh, a measure for ensuring confidentiality might be a technical one, like encryption, so that people can't see things about a key, or setting network share permissions so not everybody can see it. Another thing that might be done for integrity would be to make sure a file hasn't been changed by storing the hashes in a different location and occasionally checking the file. Uh, if I ever get around to doing the video on the uh, 
cryptography domain, then I'll be covering more what a hash is there. Or you could just Google for it. And things like making sure that the correct data is there and it hasn't been changed by someone. Then there's availability. A great example of availability would be someone DOSing a site. If someone's DDoSing a website, then it's not going to be available to the people trying to visit. Another example might be, let's say, the, a few of the hard drives in a server fail and the data is gone. Does the backup restore correctly? Does it fail? Have you tested it? That would be an example of a concern about availability, being able to get to the data when it's needed. Now, some terminology, and this is one of those things I was mentioning before that people don't necessarily think of it this way. Like, um, I usually always think of users and resources, not subjects and objects. But in um, some security uh, ways of thinking, and on the uh, CISSP test, my understanding, you think of things as subjects and objects. And to get the uh, terminology right, a subject is essentially something that is the doer. It does something to someone else. It does something to somebody. Uh, wait a second, I shouldn't have said it that way, perhaps. It does something to the object. The object is the more uh, passive role. And this just sounds kinkier and kinkier as I go through this slide. But some things can be both a subject and an object. It could be a switch hitter. For instance, usually a user is going to be a subject. He's going to be the one doing something, the doer. An object would be someone who has something done to it. A server could be both. A server could have a process running on it that goes out and accesses a file or accesses another resource on, out there on the internet or on the local network. Or the server could also be an object to the subject that is the user. The user could be acting as a subject and the server as the object when the user reaches out and tells that particular server to please run this exe for me or something to that extent. So it kind of switches back and forth depending on what you're looking at. Just remember the subject is the one initiating, the doer. And the object is the thing that has something done to it. Now sometimes these principles are at odds. For instance, a legitimate user might need access to an encrypted file, but no one has the key, or someone lost the key. This happens from time to time. If someone thinks, well, I'm going to send a bunch of encrypted emails, people respond to me, then all of a sudden they nuked and rebuilt the hard drive without thinking about keeping the key someplace else. I've actually had this happen to me before on uh, an ITP darknet where I didn't store my original key, so I lost my original name. So this would be an example of where confidentiality and availability come into conflict. Oftentimes, things take a backseat to availability. <clears throat> Anybody that's actually worked in IT knows that a lot of times people do things to get the job done and just get it out there and working, but not to make sure it's restricted down to just who needs it. You'll see a lot of people go out there and uh, right-click and share something out to the entire world, which is definitely bad form, and depending on the version of the operating system you have, at least in Windows at one time, the default seemed to be to do a full read-write share to everyone. They've gotten better since then, maybe just a default read to everyone, but still, permissions can be... Another popular triad to talk about in security is triple A, as opposed to just AA, which a lot of people in the InfoSec community probably need to join. In this case, AAA does not mean Automotive Association of America, but instead authentication, authorization, and accountability. Or to put it a different way, I'll use the security prayer. Root, grant the subject the security to authenticate as who they claim to be, the authorization to access only the objects they must, and the accountability so I know who to blame when someone fucks up. Now I'm going to spell out AA a little bit better so you know what each thing is. And there's one principle I didn't mention until just now, identification. Technically this is the first step where someone identifies what they are. Though it's not thrown into the AA triad directly, identification is generally the first step. Authentication comes thereafter. How does that person prove that they are who they claim to be? Then there's authorization. Well, you think you know who they are. Are they authorized to do what it is they want to do? Then finally, there's accountability. How do you know who did what to whom, when, and where? Now, related to the AAA concept is non-repudiation. Essentially, non-repudiation is the ability to prove someone did something that you think they did or somehow um, believe they did. For instance, a common 
thing of non-repudiation, example given in uh, legal documents and so forth, is a signature. Now, why handwritten signatures are still given much regard at all, I'm not sure, seeing as how people sign for so few things anymore, they have to at least, and so many people's signatures look so very different depending on what exactly they're writing on. My signature doesn't look anything like it does on a piece of paper as it does on a UPS tablet. So, but eh, people still use signatures, I guess it's because that's the only thing they really have. Now, digital signatures are a little bit different. At least you can say mathematically, you're pretty sure whoever digitally signed something must have had the original keys to be able to do it. And we'll cover a lot more of that if I ever get around to doing the encryption video. Another example of uh, non repudiation is like a notary. There are certain people by certain legal processes can become notaries and have a background check done and go, okay, this person can witness certain things, and if they notarize it, it's given extra credence. Logs can also be questioned as a form of non-repudiation. How good something proves something, though, is um, debatable. But basically, the concept of non-repudiation is making it so something can't be denied. Another concept related to AAA is least privilege. Do you really need to know that info? A classic example of this is when you're doing your day-to-day -day computer activities, web surfing around, editing documents, do you really need to be an administrator in the box? The principal of least privilege would say, no, you really don't for those particular tasks. You can have a separate account, perhaps, for logging in, installing applications, reconfiguring the systems and whatnot. But by always running as an administrator, you open up yourself to certain problems. For instance, let's say there is a vulnerability in your web browser that hasn't been patched. You web surf around and hit a drive-by download site and get a bunch of crap infested on your machine. Now, if you'd been running as merely a normal user account, it's not going to be able to dig in nearly as deep than if you, let's say, running as an administrator. Another example might be, let's say you're the admin in the engineering department. Do you really need to be having admin and root access in the accounting department as well? Now, unfortunately, sometimes when it comes to leap privilege, politics comes into play. For instance, I've known someone in the past who uh, got fired from their job because they didn't want to give the boss essentially root-level privileges on a web server. Now, I knew this person's boss, and I could definitely understand why they didn't want to give this individual that level of access. Uh, another example I can think of, at a place I used to work, they were taking away admin privileges, but they were only taking it away from, let's say, staff at the time, not faculty. Because faculty have, well, a little bit more power than they need in a lot of cases. But the thing was, just because someone has a PhD doesn't really mean that, um, any more secure than someone else unless that PhD isn't something possibly computer related. And even then, it's a little iffy. So sometimes politics comes in the way of putting forth good least privileged practices, and I hate to admit it, but a lot of us um, security folks also have a tendency to run as admin when we don't need to surely for convenience. Another concept I want to talk about is defense in debt. Essentially the idea is that if one line of defense fails, the next one will pick up the slack. The classic example of this might be a firewall. Some of you have probably seen the t-shirt that has Bruce Pott on it says Bio to my firewall. Some people think of the firewall as being all they need, apparently. But let's say you have a perfect firewall. It blocks all the bad packets on the internet. If I ever design my own firewall, I think I named my company the Maginot Line Firewall Company. Probably based in France for tax reasons, whatever. And let's say this firewall is perfect. It'll block any packets coming in it to it that are bad. Well, let's say one of my employees decides that they want the convenience of wireless and decides to set up in the facility uh, a home wireless router from Belgium SIS. Well, what if some like German spy out there, and let's just say German engineering wants to spy on my stuff, for whatever reason, they hook up a high gain antenna outside, focus it on my facility, and connect into my network anyway, totally bypassing my firewall. So it's almost pointless. However, if I had defense in depth, for instance, let's say I had a network access controls, so if it saw new equipment pop up, it would have to be authenticated before it could actually start passing packets. Or if I had something that, let's say, routinely in my network, maybe something like Nagios that looked out there and looked for changes, and I could spot this thing and shut it down, 
that would help. So that would be an example of defense in depth. The firewall doesn't stop it, then perhaps network access control would stop it. If that doesn't stop it, perhaps inventorying would stop it. Something along those lines. If that doesn't stop it, hopefully someone doing a pen test regularly might find this access point out there and say, um, you say you don't have wireless, but it appears that you really do. Here are a few more terms. First up, control or measure. Something set up to mitigate a potential loss. This could be keeping the loss from happening at all, or it could be just reducing the amount of the loss. And exposure, or threat surface, is essentially how wide an area would you actually have to protect. For example, if I have a box that's running FTP, SMTP, HTTP, and several other different services out on the public internet, well, the more ports it has open, the more software people can reach, and the larger my threat surface or exposure is. Another example is a lot of corporations are behind NAT boxes. A lot of universities are not. A lot of universities have their workstations on the public internet, which is a pretty huge exposure and a huge threat service that someone could compromise. A vulnerability, a threat, and a risk. This is where things get a little bit more contentious. People seem to have different definitions. I've looked in some ISC squared documentation, and as best I can tell, this is their definition, slightly reworded. Your mileage may vary. A vulnerability is a weakness that can be used to compromise confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Now, I've also heard it referred to as the vulnerability being something more specific and a threat being something more general. Let's go over threat. A threat is a possible danger of a vulnerability being exploited intentionally or accidentally. So, let's say a threat might be something like someone may get in and delete all needed files for business. A particular vulnerability could be that, well, someone left the file share permissions way too open. Or that could be done either intentionally or unintentionally as far as deleting is concerned because someone could deliberately want to delete some files or they could have just accidentally done it. Uh, maybe a better example might be, let's say you're worried about the threat of someone compromising your FTP server. Well, the threat is that someone might find a way or find a vulnerability that will allow them in to that FTP server and compromise the box. The particular vulnerability might be they figure out a particular bad string handling function in the FTP service or a buffer overflow that allows them to. And that specific way in is the vulnerability. Then finally, there's risk. The chance of a feared security threat will come to fruition or be exploited. In the previous Maginot Line firewall example, I said that if they had defense in depth, it would not have been such a bad compromise. What kind of measures or what kind of controls could have been put in place to have uh, mitigated those particular problems? One would be security awareness training for the users to not hook up home access points inside of the network infrastructure just for convenience sake. Another might have been network access control or NAC, which is essentially controlling what devices connect in. This could be done via something like a 802.1x or maybe something as simple as watching what MAC address is attached to a switch and only allow that switch port to be activated if that MAC address is known. If you go to various universities you'll find that when people connect to the wireless they might have to go through some kind of network access control to authorize the MAC address which granted is a pretty weak form of authentication but at least it's something and it may have mitigated the issue of someone coming in off the street uh, bringing in a home router and just hooking it up to the corporate network. Related to this is network inventory or change tools. Those tools out there like Nagios, or you can set up your own uh, nmap script to uh, automatically run nmap and then do an indiff to see what devices are out there on your network and see what changes. This may have allowed that particular company to have spotted that rogue access point out there on the network before someone could connect in. Another option is disabling network ports. If those currently not a machine hooked to that network port, disable it. Now that can still be gotten around by someone hooking up a switch, but it at least adds a little extra measure and the uh, person hooking up the rogue access point has to work a little bit harder and since the whole point is to be lazy in the first place, that would hopefully at least mitigate some of those um, issues. Also, machines hardened on the inside of the network would help. So if someone can get inside the network, okay they got past the firewall, they're in, 
Well, if the boxes on the inside don't have any particular vulnerabilities the person can get in on, then you're much safer. Another um, overkill solution might be copper walls. I think in a later section we'll go talk about Tempest. Uh, essentially what you're doing is you're making a Faraday cage so radio frequencies don't get out and so someone couldn't connect in using a rogue access point. There's actually some government facilities, my understanding, that are built with copper linings just for this kind of purpose. My understanding is not as big an issue these days, um, at least from what it was originally intended. Originally, a lot of the intention was um, CRT monitors. It was actually ways of reading what was on the screen remotely because of the RF emanations they put out. Now, I guess it'd be more of a concern with uh, Wi-Fi and whatnot. There are several broad categories of access control you'll need to know for the test. First, there's discretionary access control, or DAC. This is pretty much the way standard Unix or Windows systems work. A user or subject who controls their own files can go in there and grant access rights to other people. For instance, I can go into my home directory on my Linux box, use change mod, and grant rights to others if I want to to my files. Then there's mandatory access control, or MAC. Here, the system enforces the permissions. Users can't decide to share data they own with others unless labels permit it. This is seen to by something called the reference monitor. Works more or less like a government security clearance system. Now, where the confusion comes in for me is who is setting up the reference monitor to decide who gets what permissions and what labels. It seems to me that the person doing that is almost exercising discretionary access control if you see them as the subject or owner of the data. Uh, maybe I'm splitting hairs here. Just pay attention to my main definition as far as the CISSP exam is concerned. And then finally for this slide, there's non-discretionary access control. An example of this might be role-based access control or RBAC. This is where a user's role in the company uh, what they are, let's say a janitor, the CEO, a tech, determines their access level. Someone is placed in that role and they get the corresponding rights to that role. There's also content and context dependent access controls. An example of this might be a time based system. You have this option on Windows domains, for example, where you can go in and control what times of the day someone can be logged in at. For instance, depending on what someone's doing, you may not want to allow them to log in during the third shift if they only ever work first shift. This controls the amount of exposure they have to data, when they can get in, when they should be able to work in, so forth. Another example I've seen out in real life would be where an admin account can log in at. I used to work on a Nobel Netware network, and this was years and years ago, but there were certain stations that were used as print monitors to see what's in the print queue. Well, they had admin level privileges for the account they were logged in as. I'm not quite sure why, I'm not sure that was required or not, but they did. They had a mitigating control there though that they were only supposed to be able to log into those accounts on certain workstations. Unfortunately, that mitigating control wasn't in place like they thought it was, so someone could log in with that administrator account elsewhere on the system and it happened to have a blank password. Ooh, lovely. And finally, you can also connect to a database but not see all the records. There's different ways people go about doing this. Um, I know they've tried to set things up on some uh, database systems to where the data is encrypted so that supposedly even the administrators can't see it, but where they store the keys, the administrators can still get to the keys and if they really want to, they can read the data. And I've also heard of various ways that people go in to try to allow access to a database and draw out general information but not specifics about an individual. For instance, I might be able to pull out the uh, average salary for my company, but not pick out an individual person's salary. However, if I'm allowed to break it down by who makes what amount of money in a particular department, if there's only two people in my department, yeah, I can pretty quickly figure out what the other guy is making. There's also centralized versus decentralized access control. Now, this is the core of these concepts. Central access control, and you can think of this as sort of the main accounts where things are administrated well, centrally. This is uh, easier to uh, manage in some ways, and it also allows for centralization of authentication, authorization, and accountability. 
It's also decentralized access control where things are done at the local level. This is sometimes done for reliability. Let's say you can't talk back to the central office, but the control is put in the hands of the people near the gear. Uh, some military operations, my understanding, are conducted this way when you can't necessarily establish good communications. You can't always rely on the central point is the main thing to look at there. Then the distributed. And this is probably a better example to use as far as domain controllers are concerned. Well, you might have multiple domain controllers, multiple facilities, but each one is in sync with each other because of certain uh, overhead to having that synchronization. So distributed is essentially many sites, but with more communication than a decentralized site would have. A decentralized site, maybe someone would log into the local server, but it wouldn't be part of a domain. They'd be logging in for local account. Everything would be local. A distributed might be hey, everybody has domain controllers in a particular building or in a particular campus, and they all talk back over a WAN to each other for synchronization. Some of you have probably heard of software development life cycle. Well, there's also an identity and access provisioning life cycle. Essentially, the steps in this is you, first of all, provision. Let's say there's a new user, a new employee, or whatever. You figure out what rights they need, get them an account created, as soon as they come on board and get them set up. Then those reviews. If they change the job functions, do they still need the rights they had before? Do they still need the old ones? Can you get rid of some? A lot of times what happens is permissions creep. Someone will get one particular job at an organization, then move to a different job, but still have all the rights from the previous one. This could cause certain problems, and this is why you want regular review. Next up is revocation. If you've done your review and you figured out there are certain rights that person doesn't need or they do need, well, you add them or in the case of rev revocation, you remove those particular rights. For instance, if someone goes from being an employee to a student at a university, they might change the level of privileges that particular person has. Over time, though, folks have a tendency to get more and more authorization. So you'll see things like permissions creep where someone will get rights added but never necessarily removed. There are several theoretical security models you'll need to know for the CISSP exam. My understanding, uh, a lot of this stuff was come up with by certain people in the military back in the uh, 70s. So you don't hear much about it in modern day terms, but my understanding, a lot of the people in ISC Squared who were originally starting that off came from that sort of background. So those test questions about these sorts of things. A lot of people don't put this inside the access control domain, they put it in a lay domain, and I find I'm doing that also if I keep up the video series, but I at least want to lightly cover these terms here. First of all, there's Clark Wilson. You just need to know that that concerns integrity, makes the, making sure that data doesn't get changed when it's not supposed to get changed. Beyond that, I'm not sure what all else they actually really want you to know about it. Then again, I haven't taken the exam yet. But that seems to be the number one takeaway I get from all the materials I read on Clark Wilson. Then there's Bell Lepagula. And you'll hear a lot of talk about this. I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing the names correctly. But Bell Lepagula is about confidentiality, making sure only the people who are supposed to be able to read something can read it. It has two main principles, the no read up, called the simple security rule, and the no write down, or store property rule. And these are fairly obvious. If you're at a secret level, you shouldn't be allowed to read from top secret. That would be a read up, so no read up. Also, if you're at a secret level, you shouldn't be able to write down to something that's just, let's say, classified. So that would be the no write down. You wouldn't be able to send that data to someone else. Now, there's another principle that they sometimes talk about with Bell Lepagula, which does add integrity. Remember that Bell Lepagula is essentially focused on confidentiality. But there's a little bit of integrity in there also if you look at the strong store property rule. The, star, the strong store property rule, which is somewhat hard to say for me, is uh, that if the subject has both read and write rights to something, they can only do it at their level. For instance, you wouldn't want someone to be able to read a document at a higher level, which they already shouldn't be able to do because of no read up, and then write data over it, possibly getting rid of data that you actually want there. Now, integrity itself is covered more in the BIPA model. The BIPA model is centrally focused on integrity. 
So no write up and no read down. Now the no write up is fairly obvious from an integrity standpoint. You don't want someone overwriting good data at a higher level. Like you want, you want some of the secret clearance going in and editing what the people of top secret can read. However, the no read down might be a little bit less obvious. An example of this though might be giving the best information to the people that need it. For instance, if someone has top secret clearance, you don't want them reading the document with only secret clearance because there might be certain things admitted that is useful information that they would need to know. So you want to make sure they don't read down from a redacted version. You want to give them all the information that you possibly can by letting them read from the version that's at their particular level. There's also lattice, which is controlled by multiple labels, and I'll have to come up with some illustrations in a future video to cover that. Does the Brewer-Nash model, also known as the Chinese wall model, this has to do with conflicts of interest. Um, if you think about the prisoner's dilemma. My understanding Nash was one of the people behind the whole prisoner's dilemma um, issues and wrote all sorts of papers on that. It's one of the things that he got famous on. I think he's also the guy who um, the movie uh, Beautiful Mind was about. Though with Jennifer Conley, I think it should have been called a beautiful behind. And then there's a state machine. Essentially, a model where you know what the security states are, and as long as it stays within a certain set of states, and you're sure that for moving from this state to this state to this state is still secure, as long as you know all the possible states, then it stays secure. And I think we'll have to come up with a better illustration for that in a future video. But I figured I'd throw those out there at least so at least the terms don't seem completely foreign to you. Another concept I want to touch on is labels and clearances. Essentially, subjects have clearances and objects have labels or classifications, though sometimes the terminology gets mixed around. If a subject has clearances equal to or better than an object's labels, they can access it, assuming a confidentiality model and other caveats. This could be set up in a scheme like top secret, which is more secure than secret, which is more secure than confidentiality, which is more secure than unclassified. You could also have things set up with sensitive compartmented information, SCI, where things are based around a need to know. For instance, someone might have a top secret clearance, but not need to know everything about everything. They may only need to know about the particular projects they're on, or a particular segment of what the intelligence community is bringing in. Uh, some common examples in the United States would be Comment or SI Gamma, HCS, or Talent Keyhole. There's all sorts of access control schemes and protocols out there, and we'll cover them in a very general nature, hopefully just enough so you can spot the right answer on a test. You'll want to do some more searching around, and uh, I hope to eventually have a list of books I recommend for checking things out, but a few of the protocols we'll be talking about are PAP, CHAP, RADIUS, DIAMETER, and TACAX, and TACAX+. Plus. First, there's PAP. PAP is Password Authentication Protocol. It's defined in RFC 1334. Essentially what it does is it sends the password in the clear, which is bad enough as it is, allowing it to be easily sniffed. Later versions do actually add encryption to the password, However, it's the same password, just encrypted, so it's something you can do called a replay attack. Essentially, the way PAP works is the client will say, or subject in this case, might be a better term to use, will say, this is my plain text password. How are you doing? And the server will go, oh, okay, that's the password I have for you, too. It matches. I'll let you do whatever you need to. Now, even if that was encrypted instead, as long as you know that the particular protocol is PAP, where you could send the exact same encrypted response, and still be able to authenticate using a replay attack. Chat mitigates the problem of replay attacks by using a nonce and a challenge response system. Chat stands for Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol and is defined by RFC 1994. Here's the way it protects against replay attacks. First, the authenticator tells the authentication server that it wants to connect. Then, the authentication server sends a challenge. This is also known as a nonce. The authenticator takes the challenge given by the server, and instead of sending its password in plain text across the network, it does a mathematical transformation with its secret, its password, 
perhaps it's the password hash, for example, and does mathematical transformation on the nonce and then sends this back to the authentication server. When the authentication server also has the same secret, it can do the same mathematical transformation, and if they end up matching, well, the server goes, hey, you must be who you say you are, so I'll let you in. This can be used for mutual authentication also if challenges are issued both ways, as in server the client and client the server. But the size of the nonce matters. For instance, the mathematical transformation is done on a very small nonce. Let's say it was only one bit. Well, you can listen for a very short time and figure out there's only two possible replies. So you'd be able to still do a replay attack. In practice, it's much, much, much bigger. Let's use a better example. Let's say the nonce is only one byte. You would have 256 possible replies. And if you sat there long enough, you could potentially see them and do a replay attack. So the size of the nonce matters. Let's illustrate this a little better with some animation, just because I like pointless animations. First, the one that's authenticating, the subject, might go something like, tell hell, old chap, I'd like to log on, to which the server that's handling the authentication will go, okay, well, we both have a password hash for you. We got the same password hash, so let's do some mathematics on it. I'll send you a nonce. Do the mathematics on this number and send me back the results. The one trying to authenticate does the mathematics on the nonce with its own shared secret, then sends this back. If they match, then the authenticating server says, oh, okay, all's good, and lets the authenticator in. Another authentication protocol you'll want to know about is RADIUS. RADIUS stands for Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service. It's defined in RFCs 2865 and 2866. Now there's two ports that are officially used with RADIUS. The first is 1812 UDP for authentication and the other is 1813 UDP for accounting. However, older versions used 1645 UDP and 1646 UDP for the same purposes so they were never officially assigned. Messages are passed in attribute value pairs or ABPs and they have the following codes access request, access accept, access reject, accounting request, accounting response, access challenge, status server, which is experimental, and status client, which is also experimental. A successor to radius is diameter, and the joke is diameter is meant to be twice as good as radius. It's currently considered draft, at least by ISC squared, though I've heard other reports from uh, different sources about whether or not it's actually considered draft or really production at this point. RFC 3588 is where you can look for more information on it. Instead of RADIUS's 8-bit attribute value pairs, Damner uses 32-bit value pairs. So you can have a lot more possibilities. Instead of only 256, you have, well, about 4 billion something. Diameter uses one server, RADIUS uses many servers, and diameter uses port 3868 TCP. So if you can remember those key differences, that's probably the things you're going to spot on a test. The next protocol we'll talk about is TACX and also TACX Plus. TACX stands for Terminal Access Controller Access Control System, which kind of makes it a strained acronym. It requires the user to send an ID and a static password for authentication. TACX, according to what I've read, uses ports 49 UDP and in some cases 49 TCP, though I get different reports depending on what I read. TACX Plus, however, is just 49 TCP. TACX Plus allows for two-factor authentication where I've, for what I've read, so I'm assuming the original TACX did not. While RADIUS only encrypts the password on the wire, TACX Plus encrypts all the data beneath the TACX Plus header, so this includes things like username. Also keep in mind that TACX Plus is not backwards compatible with TACX, and according to at least one thing I read, it's less of a successor and more of a complete rewrite. In the next section, we'll talk about procedures and practices. I've already covered some of the concepts related to least privilege and need to know. Only give people the privileges and rights they need, and only let them know the information they need to know. And I was giving some examples earlier. Some other concepts we want to talk about, though, are separation of duties. Sometimes you want to avoid conflicts of interest in somebody. For instance, let's say there's a bank teller. 
if the person who controls the money drawer, but they're also the same one that counts it in the night, well, it becomes a whole lot easier to steal. That would be an example of separations of duties. Uh, I'm trying to think of another good example would be, oh, well, auditing source code. Having the programmer of the source code audit his own code may not be the best call. Another concept we get across is rotation of duties. Let's go back to the bank example I gave previously. You may have someone else count the drawer and the person who handles the drawer is a different one. However, let's say they work together for a certain amount of time and they become friends. Well, they can start to collude and you still have the same problem you originally had. It's a little bit more complex, but still a possible problem. My standing on casino floors, the people working the various uh, casino games change out so that you don't have that particular problem of collusion, at least not as much. So that's an example of rotation of duties. Rules-based access control is essentially if-then statements that determine what can be done by a subject to an object depending on certain properties of both the subject and the object. A classic example would be firewalls or file permissions. In the case of firewalls, I've given an example at the bottom of the slide of a simple uh, firewall rule on a Cisco box to control access to some web servers. You could do something along the lines of say, if traffic is coming from this given IP to port 80 on this other given IP, allow it through or drop it. That would be an example of an access control list entry or an ACL. Another example might be file permissions, and if you ever use ChangeMod, you've seen a good example of that where you can go in there and grant permissions to people based on whether or not world should have read, world should have write, the user should have read, the user should have write, or the group should have read, and the group should have write. Not necessarily in that order, but you get the idea, hopefully. There's all sorts of access control types and categories. The three main categories we'll talk about are administrative, aka directive, technical, and physical. The six types we'll talk about are preventative, detective, corrective, recovery, deterrent, and compensating. Now, administrative is also known as directive. This is essentially policy and procedures, things that are written down, possibly regulations, laws, or certain things you have to comply with. Also, user training generally falls underneath the administrative category. Technical or, well, technical measures, either software or hardware that does them. And classic examples would be firewalls, any malware on the system, operating system settings, and the use of encryption. Physical controls would be things like guys of guns, guards being a classic example, barbed wire fences, gates, man traps, locks and doors, or automated sentry guns if you want to go all out. Though I don't recommend setting those up at um, your office. I think it might be frowned upon. When it comes to types, things get a little bit more fuzzy. For instance, the classic uh, example of a preventative control might be a firewall that blocks certain access into a system. However, if you're logging packets that are coming through the firewall, it could also be considered a detective measure. Another example of a preventative measure might be background checks before someone is employed locks to keep people out of doors, or access control lists that control, let's say, what people can do to certain files and folders on a system. Detective controls, the classic examples would be things like alarms or closed circuit television, CCTV. Intrusion detection systems would be another example, or logs if they're being monitored at all, which unfortunately in a lot of cases they aren't necessarily. One that gets kind of confusing is corrective versus recovery. I have recovery on the next slide. Corrective is there to fix problems by correcting them as they occur. So let's say uh, antivirus quarantine, for example, might be a corrective control. Or a guard kicking someone out might be another example. There's also recovery controls. And where this is different than corrective, I'm a little bit fuzzy on. But a classic example would be to restore from a backup if a system fails, or re-image a system. You can rebuild it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. A deterrent is something that, well, in some cases it seems to be like mild form of preventative. It's something that deters people from doing something, but may not necessarily keep them from. For example, a policy, if it has no teeth, isn't much of a deterrent. However, if the policy is there and actually enforced and someone's fearful of being fired for breaking it, 
that's something to be considered. That could be acted as a deterrent, even if it doesn't stop them from doing the thing you don't want them to do directly. The thought of it and the consequences might keep them from doing it. Also, warning signs is another deterrent, and low fences. I put in low fences because let's face it, it's a picket fence is not much of a preventative measure. However, just knowing that area is fenced off and people aren't really supposed to be walking into there can act as a weak deterrent. Compensating controls exist to make up for the failings of other controls that are already in place. An example might be monitoring or supervision to see and make sure that what people are supposed to be doing is what they are doing. Now in some cases this might also fall in the, the uh, detective category, if you're talking about looking at logs or whatnot. An example you might have is, let's say you have an unpatchable web application, or perhaps the programmers are crappy but you can't fire them for whatever reason. Well, one compensating control that could be put in place is a web application firewall, or WAF. This could potentially stop some problems, though it does seem kind of like a band-aid versus just fixing the broken code. As I alluded to before, there are a lot of controls that fall into more than one type. Generally the category is pretty clear. For instance, you can tell something that's technical, physical, or administrative fairly simply, but it might fall into more than one type. Generally for the test, you probably want to focus on its predominant type. For instance, a firewall, it's clearly a technical control as far as its category is concerned. But its type primarily is preventative, keeping things from happening. However, as I alluded to before, it can also be used as a detective measure if you're looking at the logs coming from it. And it can also be seen as compensating if it's sitting in front of a bunch of very hardened boxes that are all patched up and have very few services running. In theory, the firewall won't necessarily be needed, but it's still there to compensate for any kind of lacking in the hardening of the boxes behind it. So depending on how you look at it, it could be a compensating control. Though generally, for the sake of the test, you probably just want to think of it as preventative. A guard's another example. It's clearly something that falls into the physical category, but it can be in different types. For instance, if they're standing in the way, they could be preventative. Marines guarding an embassy would be a good example of a preventative control. Could be detective if they're sitting there and they're watching for when someone's trying to get into the facility, or they might see footprints or something like that and be able to detect a break-in has occurred. There's also a certain deterrent factor to having one. Even though if we're way off in the distance in a guard shack, just knowing they're there might deter some people from doing activities you don't want them to do. In the example of anti-malware, it's clearly a technical control. However, it can be both detective and corrective. It not only tells you a piece of malware is there, but hopefully it can quarantine it and set it aside. Barbed wire is another example. It's clearly a physical, as far as category is concerned, but it's preventative as far as type is concerned, though this is even up for debate. You could say if someone doesn't mind getting cut up that it's only a deterrent, or uh, if someone's really dedicated, I suppose it might only be considered a deterrent. So there's a line there someplace. It could also be, I suppose, you know, determined to be detective if you happen to see blood trails coming from it. And finally, policy. Well, policy is administrative, but it has both deterrent effects and compensating effects, depending on what the policy are. So, for instance, um, being told you're going to get fired if you do this would have a certain deterrent effect. A compensating effect might be, well, during the initial process of hiring someone, you didn't know about their criminal background, but then once you did, firing them might be a compensating control. Not that I'm speaking on the morality of that one way or the other, just giving an example of how policies can be both deterrent and compensating. For authentication methods, there's generally four types. Something you know, something you have, something you are, and some place you are. My understanding is the ISC squared has been highlighting that last one because generally most people only think of the first three, but we'll cover these in more detail in the next couple slides. Something you know is fairly straightforward. This is classically a password or a passphrase. Now there's all sorts of subtypes of passwords and passphrases and you probably want to know some of the terminology. A static password is essentially a password that does not change. It stays the same. It's not different every single time. Even if you change it every few months, it's still considered, for the sake of this definition, a static password. It's quite uh, crackable and uh, depending on the complexity rules, 
It's also easy to forget and makes people possibly likely to write it down. A one-time password is something where you give someone a password they can only use one time. The problem with this is it's hard to manage. For some systems, this may work. For instance, give you a one-time password for your first login, but then you have to change it to your own static password. Dynamic passwords are generated by something like a token. For instance, you might get your own challenge response system where uh, what you're trying to log into gives you a number, you have to type it into a pen pad, and then once you do that, you can log into the system with the password it gives you. That would be an example of a dynamic password, which also kind of includes a something you have component to it. A passphrase is essentially a password, falls into the categories we mentioned before, but it's usually easy to remember, but hard to crack. What a passphrase is, is essentially, instead of just having one single word with all sorts of complexity requirements, you just have a long string of text that has less complexity in many ways, but since it's a long sentence that actually makes sense to a human being, it's easy to remember. And keep in mind that as you add characters on it, you are adding complexity and making something that's harder and harder to crack. For instance, let's say you only have uh, alphabetic characters. Well, if you have 26 possible bit possibilities for a character, if you have a 10 character password, that would be 26 to the 10th power. However, if you have, let's say, 60 characters because it's a sentence, well, 26 to the 60, and that goes up even more when you throw in punctuation and so forth. Then there's also security questions. Some people use uh, password reset systems that ask you a few security questions, and then they'll actually just send you the option to click on a link and be able to reset your password. Depending on what the security questions are, this can be pretty bad. For instance, um, Sarah Palin, some of the security questions for her, I think, was something like, where did you meet your husband? For a public figure like her, people knew where she met her husband, so that was fairly easy to crack. The other option you have on security questions is to lie, but then can you remember your own lie? For instance, I could put in my first pet's name was Puff the Magic Dragon, but am I going to remember that later? Someone suggested to me once that for security questions, you type in the true answer and tack on kind of a special secret password that you use just for those security type questions so that it's more difficult to get around. So let's say my first pet was a Puff the Magic Dragon in reality. I might put in Puff the Magic Dragon and some password that I only use for security questions, no place else. There's all sorts of potential attacks against passwords and passphrases. We can break them into several categories. One of the first one I want to talk about though is online attacks. An online attack is essentially where you keep throwing passwords against the prompt until you either get in or you give up. With an online attack, the service is remote usually or maybe it's right in front of you but you don't have access directly to the password hashes which we'll talk to shortly. An example of an online attack might be trying to brute force past someone's telnet service. So you just keep throwing passwords and usernames at it to either let you in or you give up. Now an offline attack happens against things like password hashes. I'm going to cover hashes in more detail hopefully in a later video, but a hash is essentially a scrambled password. You take a password, you throw it for a hashing algorithm, and you get out a string or number that is not easily reversed back into the original password. In theory, it shouldn't be able to be taken back at all. There are also however, certain ways of taking that hash and figuring out what the original password was. One type of attack for that is a dictionary attack. Now, in the case of a dictionary attack, what you do is you take those words in the dictionary and hash each one of them and compare them to the hash you have for a user's password. If eventually you find a collision, you find some word in the dictionary that matches that particular hash after it's hashed, then well, you have a pretty good idea what the password is. And even if it's not the true password, as long as it generates that collision, you should still be able to log in with it. That's using a dictionary. There's also brute force attacks where you ev use every single possible combination of a certain character set. The problem with this is it's really slow. I mean, if you're just running through all alphabetic, you can generally crack some fairly fast with this. However, once you get out to a certain number of characters, like the length of a passphrase, it's probably not bloody likely to happen. There's also things like hybrid attacks. Hybrid attack takes a dictionary and then 
changes certain things about the words in it as it tries each one of them. For instance, it might go through and place all the L's with ones, all the I's with ones, all the O's with zeros. Actually, my buddy Martin Bossa did, I think he did a presentation once on uh, password fingerprinting. And you can kind of tell from the organization's password policies how people might mangle common words. So if you have a bunch of common words in a dictionary and you have a hybrid attack going that automatically tries all sorts of different permutations of these same words with things replaced, then you might possibly be able to get in. If you look at uh, Kane and Abel, it supports these three types of attacks as far as dictionary, brute force, and hybrid attack. And all three of these could be applied on both an online attack or an offline attack via hashes. Though, keep in mind, an online attack using brute force would probably be incredibly slow unless someone chose a really piss poor password. There are several counters to common password attacks besides just more complex passwords. One of them is account lockout. You can have the account only be allowed to be unsuccessfully logged into so many times before you lock the account out and no one can log into it without either letting a certain time pass or calling on an administrator to unlock the account. A different option is just to have the password prompt return more slowly each time someone fails to log in properly. For instance, the first failed login attempt, the password prompt comes back again in one second. Two failed login attempts, two seconds. Three failed login attempts, four seconds, and so on and so forth. And this can greatly slow any attacker, probably to the point to where online password attacks are pointless to even attempt. Also, auditing your logs is important to see if you can find these sorts of failed login attempts. Now, for offline, it can get a little bit more complex. If someone has physical access to your box, generally, it's no longer your box. But there's some things you can do, for instance, locking down the case, going and putting in a BIOS password and only allow it to boot from the local hard drive. Otherwise, what someone like I would do, if it's a Unix box, I'd boot from a CD, go into Etsy shadow on the system and copy out the password hashes. In case of a Windows box, I'd grab the SAN and system hives and crack the passwords in something like Hashcat. Not too difficult to do. and actually pretty fast because Windows does not use salts. Now, what a salt is, is an extra number that's figured into the hashing algorithm. Instead of just hashing your password, it hashes the salt and your password. And in theory, your salt should be unique on a system. So as I said before, Windows boxes don't use salts. Most Unix type operating systems do. So it figures the salt in, and here's an example of a password storage hash from a shadow file on a Kali Linux system. The part in yellow defines what hashing algorithm is being used. You know, Unix passwords on different systems can use different algorithms. In this case, I believe it's a SHA-512. The part in red is the salt. This is figured in with my password to calculate my password hash. And my password hash is what's in blue. Now, what's important about doing this, it means if more than one person has the exact same password, as long as they have a different salt, the hash is going to be different on the system. So if someone cracks one hash, it doesn't mean they crack all the hashes. Also, it keeps people from doing something called a pre-computation attack or a rainbow table attack, where they take a whole dictionary of words or a whole series of strings, hash them all, and then can do a quick comparison to the password hash they find from you. That's one of the main reasons why salts are so useful. Another way someone might authenticate you is by something you have. This is generally a physical thing. It could be keys to get in a door, and the keys could actually be smart keys with electronics embedded in them, so it's more than just a simple pin and tumbler system. It could also be cards. I've seen magstripe cards, RFID cards, smart cards, or even cards with barcodes on them that people have to have to be able to get into a system. Beyond that, there's also tokens. Tokens are essentially something that gives you a one-time password. But there's at least two types of tokens out there. One would be synchronous, and the other would be asynchronous. Now, in the case of synchronous dynamic tokens, you have either a time-based variety, where this particular password changes every so many minutes, and you have to type it in to get in, or it could be counter-based. So every time you use one, its password changes to the next one. And these all have to be synchronized centrally. There's also asynchronous dynamic tokens, 
And this is more like a challenge response system, kind of like chat what we talked about before. Essentially, the system you're trying to log into will give you a number. You have to type this number into your asynchronous dynamic token, and it will give you back the number you have to type in to the login prompt to be able to bypass whatever it is you want to log into. You'll see systems like this implemented not only as a form of card, but also on a various phones where you can get that application for your mobile phone and you can use it for generating these numbers. Another way to authenticate someone is by using something they are. This is biometrics from the Greek word bios for life and metric for measure. This is authenticating someone using something about the body. This isn't necessarily the shape of a body part though a lot of times when we say biometrics that's what we mean. It could also be certain behavioral things but for physiological things there's the eyes, you can look at the coloration shape of the iris, or you can look at the arteries in the back of the eye to do a retina scan. There's fingerprints, by looking at the minutiae on the finger, they can figure out if this person is who at least they think they are. There's ways of bypassing that stuff though, depending on the quality of the scanner. There's hand geometry, and finally there's analbiometrics.com with some ongoing research on this fast-breaking field. Go check out that website, definitely. There's also, besides just the uh, physiological ways of doing biometrics, there's behavioral. Two common examples of that is typing style, where you can tell who a person is based on how they hit the keys, what series of keys they hit in what order, how fast it, they can go from one key to another. There's also gait biometrics, basically how someone walks, where you can teach a learning algorithm on a computer to figure out and spot someone based on how they move. There could be all sorts of practical issues with biometrics. Probably the first ones will be price. Even though the system is 100% perfect, if it costs too much for your company to afford, you're not going to use it. Next up is accuracy. If it's letting people in who shouldn't be in, it's not a particularly good biometric system. But also, if it keeps rejecting people who should be allowed in, it's going to be a massive pain for users. There's also things like speed of enrollment and use, where you want people to be able to get in log in through the system and not take very long. There's also privacy concerns. There's also medical information you can find out through biometrics that might be a little bit more private than an employee might want to let their employer know about. Also there's comfort issues. Well I mentioned anal biometrics before. That would be a prime example. And there's also safety and disease concerns. For instance, in the case of a retina scan, my understanding is your eye has to be fairly close to the device reading it. Well, that becomes more of a germ concern. Or let's say during cold and flu season, if you're constantly using a hand scanner or a fingerprint scanner, you're t constantly touching the same thing that someone else is. And that might have some issues. Now, when it comes to biometric accuracy, there's two main things you want to look at. And they figure into a third thing. False rejection rate, also known as a type 1 error. This is essentially where someone should have been accepted through but they weren't. Now this isn't necessarily a huge security problem other than the standpoint that someone might get fed up with it and try to bypass it. Essentially this is a usability problem. You'll have a lot of pissed off users because it keeps failing to log them in when it should. And this is a type 1 error. Then there's the false accept rate or false accept error where it's known as a type 2 error and you can think of this as type 2, 2 being higher than 1, 2 is worse. With a false accept rate or a false accept error, what happens is it lets in someone who shouldn't. If you saw an episode of Mythbusters that was on a few years ago, they figured out various ways of faking their way past a thumbprint scanner. Well, that would be an example of a false acceptance. Generally, this is considered the worst of the two because you generally care about um, unauthorized people getting access more than you do just pissed off users. Then there's the crossover error rate. And that's essentially where you've tuned things to where your type 2 and type 1 errors are the same. So you have the same false rejection rate and the same false accept rate. And this is the crossover error rate. And generally speaking, as sensitivity goes up, your false rejection rate is going to also go up. So the more sensitive the device is, let's say it was a fingerprint scanner that was very, very sensitive. I suppose having some dirt on the finger might throw it off if it's a very, very sensitive. 
the error rate goes up as the sensitivity goes up. However, as you take the sorry, as you take the sensitivity down, then you have a problem with more false acceptance rates. So that something that's not exactly a perfect match is allowed in and it shouldn't be. I was mentioning all sorts of types of biometrics before. One of the common ones you think of is fingerprints. These use the minutia of the fingerprint for authentication. The shape, where things are laid out, how they're oriented to each other. Cuts could possibly cause an FRR, in this case a false rejection rate, and I suppose you also, you know, obviously no glove, get love. You have a glove on, you're not going to be able to actually use this. There's also some germ concerns, especially during cold and flu season, with touching the same device that everybody else has touched their fingers to. I definitely wouldn't want to have a biometric plate to get in and out of the men's bathroom. Retina scans work on the eyeball, but there's two types of eye scans that you'll commonly see. There's retina scans and iris scans, which I'll cover next. A laser or a light is used to scan the pattern of capillaries that are going to the retina of the eye, and that pattern is used to identify someone. And this is somewhat intrusive because you have to press your eye to a cup. It also has some disease spreading issues because you have to be fairly close to the device, and depending on how you use it, minus staying someone can touch against the gooey parts of your eye. That doesn't sound very nice. So there's also health and privacy issues. For instance, pregnancy can sometimes cause false rejection rate errors. Apparently, the pattern of the capillaries in your eye—I'm sorry—in your retina can change when you're pregnant. Apparently, there was a lawsuit about this a while back. There's also an iris scan. Now, don't confuse this with the retina scan. The retina scan is the artery or the capillaries in the back of the eye. The iris is essentially the colored part of your eye. And this can be done from a little greater distance, and so the disease issue is not nearly so bad, and the scans could also be done passively at a fairly decent distance with modern technology, or at least so I understand. Because of this the distance, the germ issue isn't nearly as big a problem as it is with the retina scan. There's also hand geometry, which looks at the size and shape of your hand to figure out if you are who you say you are. This is relatively fast for enrollment and also doesn't take a whole lot of space to actually store this information. A fourth way to authenticate people that you might see is some place you are. This could be something like a GPS aware application. Now some of the ones that are out there for like smartphones are apparently not that great as far as ensuring that you are where you say you are. But let's say you're on a social network app and you want to say that you're checking into a certain location it might check to ensure that you are indeed within a certain number of feet of where you claim you are. That would be an example of a someplace you are sort of authentication. This could also be something like physical access to where the system is. For instance, if the box has no outside network connections and can only be got to via five door locks, that could be a form of authentication involving some place you are. I've also seen people try to authenticate based on where you are based on IP address. The problem with this is IP addresses are very loosely tied to where you're actually located. In general, you won't see this outside of like an entertainment system. Like you're trying to watch a BBC 6 billion and they won't let you connect because you're not coming from a British IP address. While it's loosely tied to location, and it might be better to see it as a different form of authentication. If it came up on the test, it probably wouldn't be my first choice by any means. But I just wanted to give it as a possible example. When you combine multiple factors for authentication, it's multi-factor authentication. If you have two or more, you can call it a strong authentication. Though if you just have two, you can also just call it two-factor authentication. Strong authentication could be two or three or four, or however many number of different ways of authenticating somebody. And what you do is you combine more than one of the factors. So you will combine what you know with what you have, or what you have with what you are, or where you are with what you know or any of those combinations. Commonly what you want to see is something you know and something you have. So commonly a password and a physical device. For instance, I might have a key card and a passcode. So I have to type in a passcode and swipe my key card to be able to get in through a door. Could also be biometrics and a password. For instance, if you're worried about someone cutting off someone's hand to get past the handprint scanner, well now they also have to type in something as well. Ever watch that Demolition Man movie? Awesome. 
single sign-on is the concept of setting up an authentication system where people only have to authenticate once and then they can get to all the systems they need. Now this has several benefits to it. First of all, if they only have to log in with one set of credentials one time, it makes it easier for the user to remember. For instance, a lot of times in different companies you're going to have it set up to where they might have one set of credentials to get to all the Windows boxes, but a different set of credentials to get to anything database related. If you can make this one set of credentials, then it becomes a lot easier for them to remember. This could also be a security benefit if it makes it easier for them to remember so they don't write it down, put it on a post note, and then stick it to the monitor. It's also easier for admins and developers since the administrators go to one place to reset passwords and developers just have to develop to one particular authentication type. It also has drawbacks though. You get into the whole keys to the kingdom problem where there's a central point where an attacker could attack to be able to extract passwords or password hashes. You better lock your screen as a mitigation because if someone has a single sign-on system in place, if someone logs in and then they walk away to go to the bathroom, well, if someone sits down, they can get to anything they want and not have to log in again. Whereas, well, opposed, if they had a previous system where it was less, well, less user-friendly than single sign-on, they required multiple logins to different things, then even if someone sat down on the person's workstation, they may not be able to get to everything by just doing that. Also, keep in mind that single sign-on may be hard to implement depending on the particular systems you have in place. Getting everything to synchronize properly between different databases, different domain controllers, maybe different domains, different operating systems can be tricky. If a system is set to use single sign-on over multiple different organizations, that could be Federated Identity Management, FIDM. The idea here is you log in once, but you can access resources from different organizations. And there are certain technologies in place for this, like OpenID, and security association markup language. I haven't done a whole lot of research into this. I'm not sure how much they cover in the test. And the best picture I could come up with for single sign-on is going for some place where single sign-on. Kerberos is an authentication protocol named after the free-headed dog that guards the gates of hell in Greek and Roman mythology. It was developed as part of Project Athena at MIT. Kubernetes is a type of authentication system that uses a trusted third party and a system of tickets to grant access to resources. The core goals of Kubernetes are to avoid sending the password across the network to avoid sniffing and to mitigate replay attacks by using timestamps. It can also do mutual authentication between the client and the service server to avoid evil twin attacks and the like. All this is done with old school symmetric key crypto, as in shared secrets, no public key crypto. So keep that in mind, especially with test questions. My understanding, they really like asking Kubernetes questions on the test. Stateless is one of the features that Kubernetes has. If the KDC goes down, which I'll explain in a bit, you can still keep trucking along. There are also multiple versions of Kubernetes and differences between vendors on implementation. But what follows are the basics. There are several terms with Kerberos that you probably want to remember. The first is principal or client. This could be a user or a service requesting access to other services. There's the KDC, which is the key distribution center. This is the part that actually does the authentication of principles. There's the ticket granting service, and its name pretty much explains what it is. Now this can be a separate box from the KDC or it could be on the same box as the KDC. For reliability I suppose you'd actually want it as a separate box so that if the KDC goes down the TGS can still keep on trucking along. Another concept to understand is Realm. This is basically the thing to which you are authenticating to. The things are all in the same Kerberos Realm. Something akin to uh, a domain let's say. There's also the ticket. And a ticket is something that is given to the client and principal to use to prove to services that it, it is who it says it is when it makes requests. To make the following animations easier to understand, I decided to put all the entities in one place. First, there's the client or the principal. This is the thing that's making the requests. 
It could be a service or it could be a person. It's what's requesting the access. It has its own symmetric key for authentication and encryption that is also known by the key distribution center. Now the key distribution center, at least in the way I've drawn it, is all on one box. In reality, you might see situations where there's the KDC separated from the ticket granting server. But for the sake of simplicity of animations, I put them on one box. Just remember for the test, the KDC and the TGS are not necessarily on the same box. This part contains the secret keys for pretty much all the entities in the network inside that particular Kerberos realm. Now the two parts that are going to be in the one I'm illustrating are the authentication server which handles checking to see if the user is valid and has used the right password, in this case in the form of the user's secret key. It also sets up session keys to the ticket granting server and gives out the ticket granting ticket, which we'll cover more in a bit, abbreviated TGT. The ticket granting server, or TGS, is the component that, when presented with the ticket granting ticket, should be able to hand out tickets for services if the user has the right permissions. Then finally, those server services that you authenticate to by giving them a ticket when making your requests. The first thing that needs to take place is for the client to make a plain text request for a service to the authentication server, or AS. No password is in the message, just client identifying information so the AS can find the right key in its own database of credentials. Once the authentication server has this, it can send back to the client two messages. The first message will have the client slash TGS or ticket granting servers session key. This is a key that's meant just for communication between the client and the TGS and is used later on for communications. This particular key is encrypted when it's sent to the client using the client's shared key which the KDC or authentication server already happens to know. Also sent is a message containing the ticket granting ticket. Now this is encrypted with something different. This is encrypted with the ticket granting server's key, which of course the ticket granting server knows and well the KDC functioning as the authentication server happens to know also. So it's their shared secret. This particular bit of information that's sent, the ticket granting ticket, has details like the user, the network connection, the timestamp for when the ticket is going to be valid for, as well as the client slash TGS session key and etc 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 more information. The second message is encrypted again using the secret key of the TGS so the client itself can't actually decrypt it but it can dec decrypt the client TGS session key so it can pull that out and take a look at the first message A can be decrypted by the client since it is encrypted with the key they know. The session key will be used for later communications back to the TGS. The second message, the TGT, the ticket grand ticket, cannot be decrypted by the client since it is encrypted with the secret key of the TGS, the ticket granting server. This TGT will be presented to the TGS later. Notice that at no point did the password need to be sent across the network as both the KDC, or in this case the authentication server, and the client had pre-shared. Now that the client has the ticket granting ticket, it can request service tickets so it can actually use services. To do this, it has to send either two or three messages to the TGS, the ticket granting server. The first one we'll talk about is a message that contains both the ticket granting ticket and the ID of the service that's being requested. The reason I said three messages earlier was that depending on who's writing up the summary of how Kerberos works, they might include the ID in a separate message and specify that it is a part of the exchange that's sent unencrypted. Another message that's sent is a message encrypted with the client slash TGS session key with a timestamp and a client ID in it. This is known as the authenticator, but to be more specific, let's call it the 
client slash TGS authenticator. Now the ticket granting ticket was sent using the TGS key. So, well, the TGS key is going to be known by the TGS, the ticket granting server. So it can extract out this ticket granting ticket and be able to use it. It now has the client TGS session key for communication back to the client and the TGS now sends back two messages to the client. The first one is the client to server ticket encrypted with the services secret key with details like user, the network connection, tickets valid period, client TGS session key, etc. It also sends a message containing the client server session key encrypted with the client TGS session key. As you get through Kerberos, you understand more and more why public key crypto is such a beautiful thing. Now that we have a ticket for a service, we can move the KDC and the ticket granting server out of the way. Once the client has the ticket from the messages sent in step two above, it can request a service. The client sends the following two messages to the server the service is running on. A message containing the client to server ticket encrypted with the services secret key that was obtained earlier, and a message encrypted with the client server session key with a timestamp and a client ID. This is known as the authenticator, but to be more specific, let's call it the client server authenticator. The server server can then decrypt the ticket using its secret key and gets the client server session key. Using the client server session key, it can decrypt the client service authenticator and can check it. The service server can then send back a message encrypted with the client server session key that contains the timestamp found in the client server authenticator incremented by one. This is done to help mitigate replay attacks. The client decrypts the message using the client server session key and makes sure that the timestamp is valid and incremented. If it's valid, the client will trust the server and start using the services. Mutual authentication is why this is done. If everything matches up, it's all good in the hood and they can start communicating. For more information on Kerberos, check out the version 5 spec in RFC 4120. Kerberos has various strengths and weaknesses. A few of its strengths are mutual authentication of the client and server, the use of timestamps to mitigate replay attacks, and a certain amount of statelessness. The KDC or TGS can go down and authentication can still work for a time. Now as far as weaknesses are concerned, the keys are all stored on the KDC, making it a tempting target. So you have sort of the keys to the kingdom problem. Also, the KDC or TGS are single points of failure, though currently valid tickets should continue to function for a while. Also, replay attacks are possible for the lifetime of the authenticator. There's also been some cryptographic attacks involving requesting an encrypted message from somebody by pretending you're someone that you're not and trying to do, I believe, a known plain text attack on them to try to figure out what a person's key is. Though there's been mitigations put in place for that. It may also be possible to get the principal's key off of the client if you happen to have local access to the box and can search through memory. Another authentication scheme you should know about is Sesame. I'm assuming they chose the name based on the uh, story from 1001 Arabian Nights where someone uses Open Sesame as a password. Sesame stands for Secure European System for Applications in a Multi-Vendor Environment. It's another single sign-on system. It's kind of a spiritual successor to Kerberos. Instead of using symmetric key crypto the way Kerberos does, it uses public key crypto, so no plain text client private keys need to be stored on the authentication server or hashes for that matter. You would just need the public keys stored on the authentication server. Also, instead of using tickets, it uses something called privilege attribute certificates or PACs. Another system to be aware of is CryptoNight, developed by IBM. It's another ticket-based system 
similar to sesame and Kerberos, instead of using timestamps and having to keep very close time sync between different boxes, it uses challenge response and nonces to authenticate somebody and to mitigate replay attacks. Some of the concepts I'm just going to mention. Logs, just do it. Collecting logs, reading logs, retaining logs. This goes into where well, we talked about the three A's before. Well, logs are about accountability, knowing who did what. You may want to look into security information and event management, send devices to be able to collect data and quickly pass through it. Now, the next set of definitions are probably going to have a lot of points of contention. The definition of hackers, for example. I remember something Jason Scott once said about people who use the term hacker. It's a lot like the people who use the term biker. They mean different things by it, depending on who it is you ask, whether or not they consider themselves a biker, and so forth. I'll go with a definition I found in one of the ISC Squared books. A person who attempts to break into computers that he or she is not authorized to use. However, even they seem to go against this in some of the definitions of other types of hackers. For instance, an ethical or white hat hacker is someone who does it with authorization and then writes up reports and says how they got in so people can fix problems. A black hat hacker is someone generally considered to be a criminal hacker, though I don't know many people who would um, consider themselves that. A gray hat hacker might be someone who behaves ethically generally, but doesn't necessarily always follow the law or perhaps has a slightly different view on how to handle vulnerability exposures and how to report them. I suppose you can even have a chartreuse hacker if you really want to, though that would be a pretty ugly hat. I think the whole hat thing is kind of silly, but people have different definitions. You can think of ethical and white as being good, black as being bad, gray being somewhere in the middle, but it's, well, I think it's all kind of silly. Now, crackers is another term used for black hat hackers, and even one of the ISC Squared books seemed to point out that ha crackers was a better term. However, cracker is, um, well, it means in things to people. For instance, to me, uh, going on bulletin boards with a buddy of mine back in the early 90s, cracker meant someone who cracked copy protection on software. It could also be a racist term for white people from the South. Now, hacktivists are people who are generally politically motivated to compromise systems. Although some people who are labeled hacktivists I think are more in it for the lulls and it's not really political. Political is an excuse. It's more just for the hell of doing it. And there's a lot of crossover into this from script kiddies. These are generally less skilled people who take others canned exploits and throw them at systems. There's outsider attacks and most of the people I've listed above would all fall in the category of outsiders. There's also insider attacks. This could be either malicious, someone got pissed off at work and decided to copy a bunch of data and throw it out on the internet, or perhaps steal some company secrets that they can sell to someone else, or it could be unintentional, like some dumbass just accidentally deleting a few folders off a server because they didn't know quite what they were doing. Hell, I've done that before. There's also bots and botnets. These are automated systems that go out and try to, well, in the case of bots, you control them via a command and control channel and we get a bunch of bots together that's your botnet and some bots can be semi self-spreading or people may have drive-by download sites where people visit a website and all of a sudden they get a bot infection or people may be constantly scanning the internet to find hosts they can infect with a bot to add to the botnet if you ever actually sniff the connection coming in you'll see if you're exposed on the internet there's constantly stuff probing you and it's hard to follow up on all of it matter of fact I'd say damn near impossible unless you have something filtering traffic before it ever gets to you. And there's also fishers. These are people who send email messages to try to scam someone. The uh, I'm a prince from Nigeria and I just need your money or your help getting money out of my bank account. Would you please forward this amount of money to me as a sign of good faith and I'll tell you the rest of the details. That's an example of a fisher. Now spear fisher is someone who spends more time on the mail. Instead of something really general with no details in it, something that's meant to be sent to tons and tons of different people, a spear fisher does things slightly differently. They'll research an individual mark or a person they want to attack and then craft an email more specifically suited. For instance, um, what if say I wanted to do a scam on a bunch of uh, companies? I could research who's at that company, information about the company, and then send my phishing attack to just that company and say, hey, 
here's a legal notice that we think you're infringing on copyright at XYZ Company. Please go to this website and fill out this information. And that website could be asking for them to send credentials, or it could be something that just does a drive-by malware install. When it comes to testing, definitions and terminology is pretty much fucked. You have to ask what someone's doing exactly when they say they're doing a certain type of test. Not sure what the ISC squared considers these various types of tests, but I'll give you a rough definition that I get from the industry and in various books. Now, so a security assessment, it really depends on who you ask. It could be a more holistic type of um, test where it includes a security audit and a pen test, or it may mean something else entirely depending on who it is. Now, a security audit, that again depends on who you ask. In my mind, and in some other people's minds, an audit generally means going through a checklist going, okay, they got this, they got that, they got this, they got that. But mm, that's not necessarily a complete assessment. Then people use the terminology different depending on who you're asking. There's also various types of scanning someone can do. Port scanning, just seeing what services are open on a box, at least on the TCP IP stack. A vulnerability scan, where it's a little deeper and they're actually probing to see if, okay, how does it react to this? How does it react to that? Okay, this reaction indicates this particular vulnerability exists there. There's also application scanning, where someone will take application source code and take a checker that automatically looks for certain common flaws like people who um, are copying strings in C but aren't actually checking bounds or using unsafe functions that don't automatically take care of bounds for you. Then there's pen testing and in some people's minds a security assessment includes a pen test and in other people's it's something different. In some people's minds apparently a vulnerability scan is a pen test though uh, not in the minds of the most of the people who I actually uh, respect in security. A pen test comes in different way, forms. Generally what you're doing during a pen test is you're acting as an attacker to see if you can get in, write up a report, and send it to the client so they can actually fix the problems. Now there's different types of pen tests. There's a black box pen test where you get relatively little information. You're a complete outsider. You have to figure out everything on your own about the system. There's also a white box pen test where you're given a bunch of internal information about the people's network so it takes you less time to do reconnaissance. Then there's a gray box pen test, which is somewhere in between. Now, I personally think a lot of times those cases where people think that um, the black box pen test is more realistic, but really it only costs the company more money. If a attacker is really concentrating and they really want to find the information, it's just going to take them longer. So the longer the attacker takes, they'll eventually be able to find out a lot of information. However, in the case of paying a pen test to do it, that time is money, and you could probably have saved the pen tester's time and the company who's hiring the pen tester money by giving them the information in the first place. It kind of comes down to Cook Charles' principle, which I might mention again in the encryption volume when I finally do that video. But in Cook Charles' principle, the idea is you should be able to give away all the information but the key and still have a system be secure. In this case, the keys would be, well, actual encryption keys, passwords, and whatnot. Otherwise, the attacker should still be able to know all the things about how the system works and still not be able to compromise it. Finally, if there's any questions, send them to me. The way I've constructed this video, hopefully if I get anything massively wrong, I can edit subparts of it without screwing up the entire video. So if you have any questions, comments, or whatnot, send them to me. You can reach me at irongeek at irongeek.com or just follow me on Twitter.